Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 132, The Year in Review. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my caring and generous co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? I'm good. How are you? Doing all right. So we are totally off our normal schedule <laughs> we here. Are, we are like so out of left field. It's it's just not even funny. <laughs> so the original plan was basically to just take this week off. We weren't doing any broadcasts. Mm-hmm. We weren't doing any recordings. Um, but we weren't able to get this podcast in last week before we basically shut the studio down. Right, right. Actually, it was um, two weeks ago. Yes, it was two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Because so. we knew we were going to be off the week of Christmas, but the week beforehand, you weren't feeling well, and I was kind of tired, right. and we just kind of... And we'll talk about why I wasn't <laughs> feeling well, because it actually ties into one of the uh, segments today. Right, right. Um, but I wanted to get this in by the end of the year. In fact, the the podcast we were going to do was going to be a regular you know, mm-hmm. right. entertainment news podcast. Mm-hmm. And we waited so long that that news was no longer relevant. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we decided we're going to do a year in review. Mm-hmm. So this week, um, we're going to mix things up a bit. Instead of doing our regular news articles of the week, we're going to go back and take a look and reflect on some of the big articles, the news articles of the year, in each of our respective categories. And then we'll finish up with a recap of our trip to Maryland for Ocean City Comic Con, along with some footage of the show before we end with our afterthoughts, which kind of, you know, in hindsight, set the scenes for next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, But before we do that, uh, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can find uh, audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Things. Video, no, that would be audio versions would be listed as Insights into Entertainment. Video versions of this podcast can be found listed as Insights into Things. And we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, pretty much any place you can get a podcast these days. I'd also invite our audience to write in, give us your feedback, give us your shows that you want us to plug, your your conventions you want us to plug. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things, on Facebook at facebook.com slash podcast. On Instagram at Instagram.com slash Insights Into Things. Or check us out on our official website at InsightsIntoThings.com. Shall we get into it? Sure, let's do this. All righty. Let me make sure I push all the right buttons here. The so What Happened in Disney Detective. So... Uh, one of the, the stories was that Scarlett Johansson had sued Disney over Black Widow in what might have been an even bigger story than the release of the movie Black Widow, the first MCU film since before the pandemic. Star Scarlett Johansson filed a lawsuit against Disney seeking money she believed she was owed on the film um, after it was released on Disney Plus premiere access in in addition to the theaters. Now, at the time, it was reported that Johansson had possibly lost out on as much as $50 million due to the move, and then two months later, the lawsuit between the two was settled for a reported $40 million. Yeah, and while the lawsuit itself, considering how much money she's made from Disney, both on the film and on previous films, Mm -hmm. that lawsuit was significant, but I think the implications that it had for the industry itself mm-hmm. was f- 
much further reaching than the actual lawsuit itself. Mm-hmm. It really forced the movie industry to to reevaluate its release plans, its compensation packages, mm-hmm. how it's treating its its talent now, how right. it's treating its directors right. and, and actors. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think all of that was directly result was a direct result of how we functioned during the pandemic, mm-hmm. that initial phase of the pandemic. Right. And you figure now we're in another phase of it, unfortunately. And now you're starting to see things go back into some sort of a lockdown situation slowly because of the different variants and how much more faster it seems to be spreading and people you know even people that are fully vaccinated who are are getting it fortunately very low percentage are are hospitalized with it which is a good thing yeah um but you're starting to see you know changes and what's nice is that there are still movie companies that even though they are releasing movies in the theater, they are still releasing them as a streaming uh, accessible movie. But yet there are some companies that haven't decided to go back to that. And that's kind of unfortunate because not everybody feels comfortable enough going back into a theater. So now where you could be making some more money doing, you know, a thirty dollar premiere access for a movie, you're you're losing out on that. And obviously we don't really know the implications yet because we haven't really they haven't really talked about how much you know the movie right. companies you haven't are seen in the box office numbers, you right? Know, the turnout numbers or anything like that. You haven't seen those published, really, right? The only thing you've seen, um, obviously, one of the biggest movies that you know just recently came out is Spider Man, right? Um, and that they had already broken records with the pre sale tickets for it. It uh, they sold more tickets than End Game, Avengers End Game had sold. Um, so that one has definitely been a huge box office success in this time. And as of right now, there's no plan for it to come out on Disney plus because of Sony, no plan for it to come on, you know, HBO max. So really, unless you want to see this, you have to go to the theater and I guess enough people feel comfortable or, maybe live in an environment where not to, you know, because I've talked to a couple of people who have gone and and have seen it. And fortunately, they live in a small area where, you know, maybe there were 10 people in the theater. Um, But I know if we went to go see it, the theater would be completely full. Unless we wait like another month and a half, then maybe we could luck out and have a a half empty uh, theater. Well, and I think the other thing that this kind of, uh, alludes to is the compensation package. So, you know, for the longest time, um, you had your talent was compensated flat out. You'd get a certain mm-hmm. amount for the movie. Right. And based on what your previous uh, movie, you know, uh, totals were, you could negotiate better numbers. Mm-hmm. And then we saw this idea of, of bonus numbers being, being packed in and, and Robert Downey Jr. is a great example of mm-hmm. that was as Avengers Endgame continued to rake it in to record numbers, he would continue to hit these goals and mm-hmm. get bonus packages. Right. So the the bulk of his compensation didn't come from direct compensation from a salary. It came from all these all bonuses. All the bonuses, right. And over the course of 10 years, the actors could see that trend occurring and would opt for that. So they'd take a, a small, much smaller amount for comp- direct compensation going into the movie and then just collect on these residuals as they hit these bonus right, marks. Right. And I think, if anything, this might fly in the face of that philosophy at this point where if the theaters are not going to be your primary form because they're right. no longer going to be a reliable form of income. Right. Then you're going to start seeing your actors and your directors want and everyone, more up front. They're going to want more up front. You're mm-hmm. going to see that balance now yeah. shift again. And this may be a significant change for the industry itself. 
those are all the reasons why we picked this one as, mm-hmm. as one of our top stories. Yes. Yeah. And our last two actually uh, involve the parks. Tell us about our next one. Right. So the first one, it had been announced uh, towards the beginning of the year that one of the first bombs uh, that dropped based off of the park was that Walt Disney World Transportation Service to and from Orlando Airport, known as Magical Express, would be discontinued at the end of this year. So now guests, guests as of January 1st, will have to work out uh, how they'll be getting to and from uh, the Orlando International Airport to the Disney Resorts. Um, As of right now, Mears basically seems to be one of the major uh, companies out there who have now offered their their service since the the news story broke. And Mears actually was already running this the service they were contracted through disney so they were already mears buses um and and mears drivers that were doing this now for those that are old enough to remember (laughs) or have gone to disney back in the day that was actually how one of the options to get to disney or you know back in the day disney didn't offer that as part of the package disney only started doing the busing when the cruise line actually started because it was part of your cruise experience so you got to the airport and they picked up your luggage and then they brought you to the resort or to uh the port depending on if you were doing land or sea first and then you know they took you back to the airport and that's when disney realized hey we can you know, kind of continue this. And that's when they kind of expanded it. Now, also at that time when Mir started doing it for the cruise line, when you booked a Disney package through Disney, they would suggest, hey, if you want for $17 or whatever it was, round trip, we'll have Mir's come and get you. Now, you still had to get your own luggage. Uh, They weren't getting it for you, but you didn't have to worry about making arrangements to to get a car, you know, if you didn't want to to rent a car or have a taxi or something, there was that option. And then again, it kind of morphed into it. So we really don't know what the whole reasoning behind it was, obviously. Hey, money, I'm sure, because that's what it always comes down to. So now they're kind of backtracking and going away from giving it to you for free and now Mears is offering the service. There's another uh, company that just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, I can't remember what the name of it was off the top of its head, but their motor coaches were going to have like a train theme to them. And they were showing that the drivers were kind of going to be dressed like conductors. Well, that's because they're putting <clears throat> in a new light rail Right. Line. Well, that's that's the train that – right. They're still... And that's years away. Right. And the idea with the train is that the train would more than likely go to... um, Downtown Disney. To downtown, the downtown Disney Springs area. Uh, So that's where the train... But again, that's still kind of far out. But there's this second company that has now emerged with motor coaches. Same type of thing, you know, Mears is doing. You basically buy either a one-way or a round-trip ticket... And, you know, you get your own luggage when you get to the airport, but the bus will now take you, you know, so now you have more than just Mears doing it. If you're looking for always did, though, you always had different options. Yeah, there were always, right. You could, you know, and especially now with Uber and Lyft, you can even. We used to rent a car, you could get a taxi, you could get shuttle services. Right. It's not like you get to the airport and, oh my God, what am I doing? The problem, the problem with this is not that you didn't have options to get from the airport to Disney. It's that Disney provided this to you free of charge. Mm And it wasn't free of charge. No, you know you were that paying you run for into it. Is that all these things that Disney provided that were quote free? Right, were all worked into the price of the resort, the mm-hmm. price of your ticket, the price of everything that you purchased. Right. So Disney ramps up all these prices. They raise their prices every year. Right. To compensate themselves for the service. So mm-hmm. whether or not you use that service or not, you were paying. So for, for it. instance, the last few trips down, we drove. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we didn't use any of their services mm-hmm. for transportation to get to and from the property. Right. We were still paying the full price oh, for the resort, though. Right. So 
they weren't losing money on this right. anywhere along the lines. Yeah. And and I, the biggest reason I put this in here as one of the stories to review is it's one more of the things that Disney is doing wrong now. Mm-hmm. You know, this started a few years back right. when they started the nickel and dime you with refills on soda. Okay. So it cost more for the cup than it did to fill that cup with soda. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a very well known fact in the in the beverage industry. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what did Disney do? So Disney didn't want people going back and refilling their cups at their uh economy resorts, right? So they decided to invest in this new technology that where they put a chip in all these cups, which took that really expensive cup and made it even more expensive. Mm-hmm. So now you take that really expensive cup, you take it to a more expensive dispenser, and they can tell how many times you've refilled that mm-hmm. in an effort to what? Save money to stop people from getting refills? Again, that was one of the probably the first things I think that sticks out to me, mm-hmm. followed by paying for parking. Right. For years, you could park on Disney property free of charge. They didn't have the best parking lots because everything was spread out from the resort. So if right. you didn't get there early, you were walking. They didn't offer shuttle services. Then all of a sudden. Now, this is just for the resort. They always charge correct. parking for the parks. Correct. Just, just the resort. Because they charge enough money at the resort. Right. You know, right. you're paying a 30 to 40% premium to stay on property at right. Disney than you right. would at an off property. Right. Resort. I just wanted to clarify right. that no, if, you, you. If, you you. Were a, uh, if you were just going to the Magic Kingdom for a day and you yes, weren't a you resort still guest, chain, you, had, had you to paid pay for, for parking. parking. But now. So at the resort right. now, that, that for what, 15 years we've been going, we didn't have to pay for parking. All of a sudden you do. Mm-hmm. They didn't offer any new services. You weren't getting security. You weren't getting shuttles. You weren't getting newer. Parking, you aren't getting anything for it. Right. They just decided, well, we can charge you for it, so we're going to. Mm-hmm. And it was one more thing that they needled you right. with. Mm-hmm. And now they're taking away a free service that they gave you that you're already paying for because you're paying the premiums. Right. So it's a spiraling thing. Mm-hmm. And there's no justification for it. They've provided no justification. Mm-hmm. And they make it very clear that they're not going to answer questions about it. Mm-hmm. This is just the way it's going to be right. since the new CEO came in. Right. So then that leads us to our third story, which kind of compounds this, in which Disney really took advantage of the COVID scenario mm-hmm. to kind of really lock things down and, and really nickel right. and dangle. Let's talk about right. that. So one. this was that talking about how fast passes are gone and Disney Genie Plus is coming. So since the parks reopened, FastPass Plus had been suspended, meaning that all guests needed to wait in a standby line for the attractions. And then Disney recently had announced that FastPass Plus would not be coming back and that would be replaced by two new paid options being able to skip the lines, and that's Genie Plus. Now, obviously, as everybody knows, we have not been down there since everything, so we really can't speak to what Disney uh, what what Genie and Genie Plus is like? We have from accounts, firsthand accounts, right? So it, it's just from you know people that we've talked to or seen or or read and and things like that, and it still has a lot of bugs. It is definitely not worked out yet. I think, in, in my opinion, from what I I've seen, um, again, here's another nickel and diming thing. Where now, to give Disney some credit on this, they were really one of the last amusement park companies, theme park companies, to start paying for this. I I'm cannot, just. I'm, I cannot give Disney credit for being the last I'm person just, to rob me. I'm sorry. I'm just saying it was very small. Very, 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 very small. Thank you, Disney, for being the last person in Florida to pick my pocket. I appreciate it. (laughs) Right. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, people have been seeing this in other theme parks for for years. You know, Disney was one that they were kind of the first ones, as far as I know, to even start any sort of fast pass idea. Now, for those, again, that are old enough to remember when fast passes started... 
you could only get them once you physically got to the park. And the idea behind the fast pass wasn't necessarily to cut the line, but it was almost like a placeholder for right, you. It was like so a the I, so the idea behind it was that when you went and got a fast pass, technically the fast pass time was the same should have been the same amount of time for if you had waited online. Right. So if you so got you the can fast go do pass, something else, right? And come back. So and if have to wait. the the wait was forty five minutes, roughly when you would go and get your fast pass, it would be for a forty five you know a time spot within forty five minutes, and then you could go again, do something else, and then go, and then once that fast pass time hit. Then you could go and get another one. Right. Then they kind of morphed it because the other thing, too, was that you would go and get a fast pass first thing in the morning and the fast pass time would be for like four hours yeah. later. So then it became you got your fast pass. Well, now you couldn't get another fast pass, but you had four hours to go do something else. You do something else. So maybe you ended up with three fast passes by the end of the day. Well, then they morphed it to a different, you know, as technology advanced, then if you were a resort guest, you could actually pre-book your fast pass and you could pre-book three at a time. And then as soon as your third one expired on that day, you could make another reservation either on your phone, on the app or at a kiosk. So they kind of, you know, morphed it again and again all these other parks and they weren't even offering really the same type of thing. In a lot of cases it was, you know, for like $30, you got to skip the lines on like six rides or something. So they all had their, their different version of it. And for however long it seemed to work, there really wasn't, you know, every now and then you'd get something where, you know, the system would go down or something, but all in all, seemed to work. There were certain rides that had, you know, longer waits. And if somebody didn't make their fast pass reservation, then, you know, you waited online or you went back later on in the day when maybe the the line would be shorter. Yeah. Um, the one thing that did kind of stink was that, you know, for certain rides, you know, first thing in the morning, all the fast passes would be gone. You wouldn't even be able to like get a Pinocchio, fast. <laughs> which you couldn't even get a fast pass on. Pinocchio. Not Pinocchio. Not Pinocchio. Uh, Peter Pan. Peter Pan. Peter Pan. Well, Peter Pan was always one we would always try and get, and usually we did. But if you went to the park that day, you probably couldn't right. get one. So, again, you know, system seemed to work. Didn't really see a need to to not have it work. And then the other thing, too, is that when the park opened after, while COVID was still going on, it was shocking that they didn't have it in place right, right away because why would you that want... That would be the best time to have it in place so you don't have people standing shoulder exactly. to shoulder in line. You give people, you know, five passes, right. you know, you, you up it, you do something more. So people were wondering what the heck's going on. There was all these, you know, all these rumors. And obviously now this is what we have. So now we have the Genie Plus system. So you can have the free version that... Basically gives you suggestions right. on. It basically, the the Genie Plus gives you suggested times when you should go get in line because it does a statistical analysis on when those rides are least booked. Right. So it doesn't get you on a fast pass. Right. Line. Exactly. It basically, oh, so instead of waiting forty five minutes, you'll wait thirty minutes right. or whatever it is. So then they created the plus version of it. So for fifteen dollars. Per day, per person, it gives you, I don't even know, up to three or something lightning lane things. Except for certain rides. Right, exactly. Not every ride is under it. And basically what happens, and, and as far as I know, I don't think you, and again, I, I'm, I'm not an expert, so I could be saying all this wrong stuff, so please don't take this as gospel. This is just from, you know, so you, you kind of put it in and it says, hey, go to this line or whatever, and, you know, you might have a five-minute wait or, or something, and you get on that. Well, then there's the 
extra version of this, which is, I believe, I think that's what the lightning lane is, where the the genie plus is the the other lane. And this is where now you can pay a premium, an extra fee to basically cut the line to get on right away. And it's not the same. Not every ride is the same price. Some are twelve dollars. Some are fifteen dollars. And I think some are even twenty dollars. So along with your fifteen dollars that you paid to, to have the app, then there's the extra twenty so that you don't have to wait on any line. And for that, you can only do one per day. That that's definitely a a one one and now, done. Now until Disney realizes how much money they can make off right. of it. Right, and again. Not every ride is under that, and it's, you know, Rise of the Resistance and the Ratatouille ride, right. and, you know, so All it's your- premium rides. Your premium rides. So, and then they got rid of Rise of the Resistance- Virtual The queue. virtual queue, which- So let me rewind a second here. Okay, so sure. The whole reason you needed Fast Pass was because Disney wanted to cram as many people into the park mm-hmm. as- physically allowed by law right so they wanted to get as many people paying at the gate in the park as possible and as a result you wound up having lines that were just egregiously over uh, too long to to sit in Mm -hmm. so disney started to come up with a whole bunch of different ideas on how to ease the pain of that so you first got fast pass. Mm-hmm. So you could you could get through the line faster. Then you got what they did with Dumbo, mm-hmm. where they put a second Dumbo ride, which Dumbo always blew me away. That you would wait 45 minutes for like a 45 second ride. It mm-hmm. was insane. So they put a second one in and they gave you a queue, like at a restaurant. You could get a little timer. Mm-hmm. You waited in queue. You go into the air conditioning area. You play with the kids in the play area. And when your timer went off, you got in line and it was fast to get in. That worked out really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then they came out with the virtual queues. Mm-hmm. And the virtual queues worked great. The, you had to be in the park to get them. Right. Which was kind of annoying. But once you get in the park, you get into your virtual queue, and then you get called at some point in time during the day with an estimated time. So Disney generated this problem. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the people that generated it. It wasn't the, the customers that generated it. It was Disney. Mm-hmm. So this was Disney's problem. And Disney came up with some creative ways to do it without it being too painful to the customers. And they evolved it over time to make it better. And they had finally got, when they got that that virtual queue, I think that was probably the closest thing to perfection that they had. Mm-hmm. And if they had stuck with that idea and given you the ability to do two or three virtual queues a day mm-hmm. and left the original fast pass in place, you would have been fine. Right. Instead, they throw the whole thing out. They throw the baby out with the bathwater. And now they realize, well, hell, people don't like to stand in line. After 50 years of the park being open, they realize that they don't like to stand in line and they'll pay to not stand in line. So now let's just charge them for it. And they come out with this completely new system where it's progressive levels of pickpocketing. Oh, you don't want to stand in line? Well, here, here's this free service that tells you when to get in line. Oh, you really don't want to wait there? Here's another service that you can pay for now that you can get through line. Oh, you really don't want to wait? Oh, here's more money that you can pay per ride. To get, and it's ridiculous what they're doing at this mm-hmm. point in time. And as a result, we haven't been down. We haven't been down in two years now. Mm-hmm. Partly because of COVID, I'll give you that. But I don't have no intention of going down. And we're so, at least I am, so turned off by this entire money graph from Disney. And this is why we put two articles in in the recap here. We're in the process of selling our DVC membership because Disney just isn't worth it anymore. Between this, I would have put the Star Cruiser in, but the Star Cruiser, the the, the issues with the Star Cruiser <laughs> and the cost with that were just so egregious that I, I, I didn't want to revisit it again. You didn't want to give yourself a heart attack. <laughs> exactly. Like Disney has gotten to the point where they're not – They're not nowhere near as good as they think they are because you have, you still have all these services that they've, they've pulled out of service since COVID that they're not putting in place. Mm -hmm. They're not reducing their ticket prices. They're not reducing their resort prices. If anything, I think there's a price increase that's supposed to be happening. About to kick in a new price increase. 
And they're putting all these new nickel and diming things in. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know what? Disney doesn't want customers like me. We go down sometimes two and three times a year. And on average, we'll spend five, maybe seven grand. At least I will on, on a lot of merchandise down there. So, Especially with Galaxy's Edge. <laughs> so we're probably good for 10 grand a year to Disney. And that's not enough for Disney. Mm. So they're not interested in getting people like me. They're interested in getting people that can go down there that have a couple extra zeros in their income bracket than I do. And that's fine because Disney can have those people. Disney can take their money. The problem that you have is because even though they're higher margin customers where you're going to get more money out of them, they're significantly lower volume. Like, does Disney ever hear the term one percenters? So they're catering to the one percenters. Mm -hmm. Well, the one percenters, the money that you get for the one percenters is significantly less than the 99 percenters that you can be getting money from mm -hmm. regularly on a recurring basis. Yeah. yeah. The one percenters aren't going to be going down there with the same level of recurrence that your middle income people aren't. So Disney made this mistake in the eighties. They corrected it in the nineties and two and thousands, and they're making the mistake again to the point that the new CEO, Bob Chappick, there's a petition from Disney, uh, customers over 80,000 signatures to get him removed. Because even though all of this didn't happen under him, the most egregious portion of this has happened under him. Mm -hmm. And he's done nothing to correct it. Right. I'm not a Bob Iger fan, but Bob Iger is many levels below how bad Bob Chopic is mm -hmm. at this point in time. So that was our recap of Disney bashing for the year. <laughs> We're gonna take. I think we're gonna. That's what we need to call the the segment going for <laughs> Disney bashing by Joe and Michelle. We're gonna take a quick break, and we'll come back with uh, a recap, uh, a less bashing recap of our Star Wars for the year. For over seven years. The Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So with only a little bit of Star Wars <laughs> negativity here. Just a little. We'll talk about our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy recap. So the first story that, that we have in here is uh, Gina Carano being removed from The Mandalorian. When season two of The Mandalorian came to an end, it certainly looked as though Gina Carano's character, Cara Dune, was preparing for her own spinoff show, Rangers of the, Repu of the New Republic. Then in February, Lucasfilm announced that the former UFC fighter was no longer employed by the company and wouldn't be returning to the role, which was surprisingly vague for the termination of a fairly known star in a new successful series. This all came on the heels of Carano comparing, quote, hating someone for their political views to the persecution of Jewish people by the Nazi party, of which... She really had no basis on which to make that statement. Mm -hmm. Previously, she had been accused of being transphobic and made remarks about alleged and repeatedly proven to be false voter fraud in the presidential election. Not surprisingly, it was later revealed that Rangers of the New Republic 
was no longer in development. Go figure. I wonder why. Mm. So this was, I don't know, I think it kind of kicked off a whole atmosphere of uh, accountability, I want to call it. Mm. You know, where, yeah. where, where people want to use their celebrity to promote their own priorities without understanding that when you do that, you're representing the company that you're working for. Right. Now, if I went out, not being a celebrity, at least I don't think I am at this point, uh, and and I used the platform of my employer to make statements that were contrary to my employer's wishes or beliefs or stances, I would totally expect my employer to fire me mm -hmm. because I, at that point in time, is ex I'm exploiting my my employer for the attention. And this is exactly what happened with Gina Carano and – Several other people, mm -hmm. you know, several other celebrities throughout the year. And this one really kind of kicked that off. Mm -hmm. And the, just the shock on the on these individuals' minds that somebody would actually hold me accountable for something I said or done. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a celebrity and, and I'm supposed to be above the law. No one's supposed to hold right. me accountable. I'm not their puppet, right. you know. Right. And it's like. Disney has a very proven history of having clauses in their employee contracts, mm -hmm. morality clauses and non-disparagement clauses and stuff like that, that you're well, as a celebrity, as a, as a member of their staff, you're well aware of these clauses right. when you sign that contract and, and you pledge to abide by the terms of that contract. Mm -hmm. And if you violate that contract, if you go out and you say something negative and you have a non-disparagement clause, that's the same as not showing up for the work. Right. And they're well within their rights to get rid of you. Right. You know, look at what happened with Johnny Depp. Exactly. You know, exactly. on many fronts, not just with Disney, but even with Warner Brothers. Yep. With stuff that had happened, you know, in his personal life, unfortunately, that came right. to light. Because it reflects poorly on your employer. No, right. Disney is not saying you have to go out there and tote the party line and, right. and, and, and do messaging for their political beliefs or anything like that. You just need to shut up. Right. That was it. And it wasn't like she hadn't been warned. There mm -hmm. were three incidents before this. Right. Right. All you have to, if you, if you want to be that political and you want to be that vocal, you're more than welcome to terminate your contract, mm -hmm. go off and be independent or find an employer that will allow you to do that. Right. And supposedly there were other things that she had going on in the works. We haven't really heard. Which we haven't seen it. Yeah. You know, anything yet. So. You know, and then there were rumors that she was coming back to Disney, that they had worked out something. But yeah. again, she nothing, had, nothing she came had back. She had a massive image problem at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And she had done a series of Running Wild, a, a, a show with Running Wild with Bear Grylls for National Geographic, which again is another Disney property. Mm -hmm. And that came out uh, a couple of months after this controversy did. Yeah, because they didn't even want to air it they for did a not. while. They weren't going to air it. Right. And they finally decided to air it. And I have to say, it did wonders to humanize her, mm -hmm. at least in my mind, because of the vulnerability that, that – and you could almost excuse some of the stuff that she said and done just as naivety and, and inexperience mm -hmm. and seeing the world through rose-colored glasses and not realizing that there's a expectation – and that's kind of how she came across in the show. And it, it almost thought, I almost thought that after that, now that you're getting some good press and people are seeing that you really are a somewhat decent human being, Disney might change course. And they haven't. Right. Uh, so I don't know if it was worse than what was made out in the press or what. Uh, but I, I don't think she's a horrible person. I think she's made bad decisions. And. Sometimes those bad decisions we have to be held accountable for. Mm -hmm. You know, she had a great thing going and right. she's got to find something else now. Mm -hmm. But that kicked off the Johnny Depp's and the, what was it? Uh, I don't know, who was, who was a comedian that just had it? There was another comedian that just came out with an HBO special where he wound up taking heat for it. Oh, so. um, shoot. Chris, not Chris Hart, was it? No, no. Oh, why can't I think of his name? Yeah, I can't remember his name either. Yeah. But anyway, 
there was a series of these. Right, right. And and you know, you hear this term, oh, it's a it's a it's the woke society. No, right. It's not. It's it's accountability. Right. It's when you do something that's inappropriate that society, now granted, society standards change over time and they evolve. If you fail to evolve with them, then you get left behind. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people out there that have changed society. Mm -hmm. Um, Richard Pryor is a great example of that. Richard Pryor was a type of person who, when he first emerged, was considered offensive. Uh, Eddie Murphy, same thing. Mm -hmm. Offensive. People didn't like it, didn't, didn't want to hear it. And eventually he changed society to be more acceptable to his type of humor. Mm -hmm. Both of those. Right. And they're, they're great comedians. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, they recognize what the fallacy was and Mm -hmm. they, they learn how to make it work. George Carlin too. George Carlin is another great one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, these are the people that made careers out of being offensive comedians Mm -hmm. But they made it but funny. Do it, right. But doing it in a way that wasn't hurtful. Right. Like George Carlin you know? was brilliant in throwing it back in our faces. Mm-hmm. You know, he was the type of person that would look at how ludicrous society was and then make us laugh at ourselves for that, mm-hmm. that ludicrousness. Right. So unfortunately, um, Gina did not approach that level yet no. perhaps in time she will mm, maybe uh i don't think her career is is over with in the entertainment industry i think she's going to get another shot and you know hopefully it's one of those you learn from your mistakes mm-hmm. so the next one that we wanted to talk about was the new star wars shows on disney plus not disney republic like i said during the, the read through <laughs> that was really kind of funny <laughs> um so we got a whole bunch of shows uh from from Disney, in fact, we got a whole bunch of documentaries about the new shows, which was also interesting. Right. Uh, but the first one I wanted to talk about was The Bad Batch. And The Bad Batch was kind of foreshadowed in uh, the final season of Clone Wars. And it was done in such a way that it was kind of um, strange. You know, they it played no real uh, purpose, I think, in the Clone Wars series other than to make cameos to set up the new show, which left me very cautious going into it. Um, but this animated follow-up to Star Wars The Clone Wars was set shortly after the events of Episode 3 and follows the team of elite clone troopers as they seek out a new destiny following the end of the war and the rise of the Empire. And what was nice about this was that they... They jump into it in the middle of the action, right at the end of the Clone Wars, so you can kind of put little pinpoints as to where they are, so you know exactly what's happening, where everything is, and you walk into it with a a comfortable feeling if you're a Star Wars fan who watched the Clone Wars and watched the movie, the prequel movies and stuff. So that kind of helped right off the bat. And then you wound up getting uh, characters that are... Extremely well-developed, which is really a characteristic of Dave Filoni. You know, Dave Filoni knows how to write a character and knows how to make you emotionally invested in that mm-hmm. character. And he's done it time and time again, whether it's animated or or live action. And you get a character in there, this, this young clone, Omega, who I thought was really going to be this quirky little sidekick, like the Jar Jar of the series. And, and... They turn out to be one of the most pivotal people, and it makes it its so believable the way it happens. So they did a fantastic job with it. There's another season coming out. I'm very interested in seeing how the next season comes out with it. The next show is Star Wars Visions, which, again, I was very skeptical about this. <laughs> so this was the other big project, really, big animated project of 2021. And this series features 10 short episodes allowing various Japanese anime directors an opportunity to play in the Star Wars sandbox. And I've made no bones about the fact that I am not a fan of anime. Um, Don't like it. Don't like the style. To the point that it gives me a headache if I watch it for a period of time. And of the 10 that were in here, 
probably for our keepers. Okay. Um, just because of the style, the story. Like everyone knows who's a Star Wars fan that Star Wars itself was, George Lucas was inspired by Akira Kurosawa's samurai movies. And it came out pretty much everywhere in the Star Wars movies. And there was one or two episodes of Visions that literally look like Kurosawa movies. Um, they literally have samurais, you know? I mean, it's it's done in Japanese villages. It's Some of these are done so well that at the end of this, you know, 30-minute episode, I was wanting more. Mm. Now... That's a 40% hit rate for me, <laughs> for anime, which is very good. That, that's high for you. I did that's... not expect it to be that high. Right. The other six are complete throwaways, in my opinion. I'm sure I'll, people will argue with me till they're blue in the face, but I just couldn't buy into the stories. I couldn't buy into the animation style. Some of it was just too goofy. It was too cartoonish. It was very un-Star Wars-like. So, for the 10, I think it makes it worthwhile to watch the whole series and form your own opinion. Sure. And the last one was one that we just got this week, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. Yep. The Book of Boba Fett. So, we are getting the first Mandalorian spinoff in the form of Book of Boba Fett, which features Boba and his new right-hand woman, Fennec Shan, as they take control of the late Jabba's criminal empire. Now, again, when we got that closing scene in the last episode of The Mandalorian and we see him take the throne, I almost gagged because it seemed so goofy, so far-fetched. It, it just, it was cool seeing Boba show up in mm -hmm. the... The couple uh, of episodes couple of... of episodes of Mandalorian. And I was content with that. I didn't need to see a Boba Fett series, but seeing that scene where he comes in and he, you know, he storms in with the spurs and he shoots him and he takes over the throne. It was just a little too, too old Western. I was going to say too spaghetti Western yeah, for you. It was just, it was too much. And it didn't hold out much hope. We have only seen one episode so far. Mm -hmm. um, and the one episode itself does a very good job of flashbacks of showing you how he got to that point. Right. Everybody wanted to know how he survived. How the heck he survived. The Sarlacc and... pit. So mm -hmm. you get to learn that. You get to learn a little bit more history about him. Um, you get to find out why his face, you know, his body is so scarred and, and stuff. So I'm cautiously optimistic at this point. Mm -hmm. um, the first episode did not wow me like the first episode of Mandalorian did. Well, because there's no baby Yoda. <laughs> it wasn't even that. You didn't get Baby Yoda till the end. But the first episode right. of Mandalorian no. yeah. grabbed you by the throat and just shook you into, like, the new era of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. This one, you kind of mosey down the street with, with Boba on, and then somebody kicked you in the face and Well, because he, he walks. And, he doesn't, yeah. he doesn't, you know, yeah. he walks on his two feet, so. Yeah. But, you know. He didn't chop anybody's head off with the door or anything like that, like Mando did in the first yeah, episode. Yeah, well, you know. But it, it has potential. Mm -hmm. um, and my concern is that it, it it's going to be like these other Disney series, these especially the, the Marvel ones, where you get a very short season, six or seven episodes, and they take four or five episodes to ramp up to really become uh, quality. Mm. You know, we just we just sat through Hawkeye, mm -hmm. and Hawkeye. It wasn't until episode five of Hawkeye that I really started to enjoy it. There was just so much setup that they tried to do ahead of time and, mm. and kind of overthought things. And it almost makes you wonder if they had done like a three hour movie, or you know, two one and a half hour part one, part two. Right? Would it have? And that's been... what I think with Boba Fett is. I don't need a series. Right. You give me an hour and a half, two hour long movie of Boba Fett, and I think you sum up everything I need to know. Mm. And then if you want to come up with a series after that for continuing adventures and you think there's something there, great. Right. But to drag out this two hour long and movie. And I think that's what's going to happen with uh, with um, the other 
two series. Well, with that, Obi-Wan, it's not bad because you know it's a, a mini series. So true. right, but that's you what I you're only getting a couple of episodes. Right, that's true. But then the the Cassian Andor one Which doesn't need to happen. Where you could have probably you're probably gonna feel we could have done this in a Cassie and Andor could have been done his backstory could have been done as back uh flashbacks in Rogue One. True. He, yeah. There is nothing compelling about that man that makes me want to see a series on them. Yeah. yeah. Well we'll any, see one any, it... any more than I wanted to see a hand solo Han movie solo. or a sequel that they're planning on doing. Really? Yeah. Oh god. Yeah, let's talk of a sequel. Oh lord. So, but anyway Wow, you're really gonna run out to see that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's our flashback for our uh, Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Oh, you still had your uh, uh, High Republic stuff. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. See, I got so down on, on Boba there. <laughs> so, yes, oh, our, Boba. Third, our third story to reflect <laughs> on is the, the High Republic kicking off. Uh, so publishing is one area where the Star Wars franchise is coming into the new year with blasters firing. January 5th marked the official beginning Last January 5th, not the coming January 5th, of the High Republic, a multi-pronged publishing initiative aimed at shedding light on a previously unknown portion of the Star Wars timeline. Set roughly 200 years before Episode One, the High Republic explores a period when the Jedi are still at the height of their power and the Republic hasn't yet collapsed into tyranny. So what I really was focused on, they came out with a number of of comics, um, young adult novels, and mm -hmm. adult novels. And what I was right. really focused on was the adult novels. So there's really three planned in the in the first series coming out. The first of which is Light of the Jedi, which came out January 5th, which I just finished a little while ago. This was by Charles Soule. And it was a good starter. It was a little slow starting off. You were introducing characters you didn't know. Um, the one concern that I had was... When they announced the time period, you knew that it was within Yoda's timeline. Okay. And I didn't want them to basically make it a Yoda novel. So Yoda appears in the novel, but kind of in reference form. He never really plays a role in it. So you kind of get your your new array of Jedi that you, you get to see. And it's interesting because you get to learn new things about how the Jedi operate, what their organization's like how they work with technology. So it was very interesting to, to learn some of that stuff. The next one in the line is Rising Storm, which came out June 29th, which I purchased. I haven't started reading yet because I'm reading the Expanse novel at the moment. I kind of got into this late. I didn't, I didn't get into reading mm -hmm. this until uh, the fall. So I'm a little bit behind. So Rising Storm came out the 29th of June by Kevin Scott. Now, I haven't read anything by Charles Soule or Kevin Scott before. Uh, I was They've both done novels in the Star Wars universe as, as well as other things. And I was very impressed with the first one. The third one comes out January 4th, so it's coming out next week. Mm -hmm. And that's Fallen Star by Claudia Gray. Now, I've read a number of her books in the past, Lost Stars and Bloodline, and I think she's a fantastic author. So I'm very much looking forward to that one but I have to get through Rising Storm first. And they've got a lot of stuff planned for this. They've got a, a potential video game, an mm -hmm. open world video game that's going to be set in the High Republic. They have a tie-in to the Galactic Star Cruiser that's going to have some High Republic story assigned to it. Um, I was not enthusiastic about it because it's it felt very much like Disney gave up on their... Um, uh, sequel trilogy because it was terrible and they wanted to reinvent star wars like like high republic to me is almost like relaunching of star wars mm. so i was very skeptical about this and i'm i'm still cautiously optimistic again to see where this goes um but so far you know the first novel itself i think held its held its own okay so that's all for our flashback on, well okay uh Edge, Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We're going to take a quick break, come back with our entertainment news real quick, and then sum up. We're actually pushing late right now. Oh, so, my goodness. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be right back. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. 
talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment recap. So here were our our top, I guess, you know, stories that we we wanted to just kind of go back over. So the first one was the Jeopardy host debacle. So who knew that the game show Jeopardy would be such a big topic of discussion in 2021 as long running series as the long running series looked to find a new host after the death of Alex Trebek, it hired one in executive producer Mike Richards. But that didn't last long after a series of sexist, racist, racist and homophobic, homophobic. Wow, I can't talk today. Comments he made on a podcast between 2013 and 2014 were unearthed. He was removed from the job and since his departure, Big Bang Theory alum um, Maya uh, Bialik and multiple time Jeopardy winner Ken Jennings have been sharing the duties of hosting back and forth. And this wouldn't have been such a big deal if they hadn't made such a big deal about bringing all the celebrities in right. to try out for it. Right. And that was the thing is you had all these different people that came and were filling in and you had all these people that were like, oh, this would be a great host and and yeah. this would be a great host and why don't you have this one? And then they totally went with an executive producer who right. nobody really knew and then all of a sudden you well, have I'll all these it was things. was his decision to, to do Probably. It, so. He was like, oh, I'll do the job. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, so right now it goes back and forth between the two and maybe that's how they'll, they'll kind of leave it because... Uh, Mayim was actually, she was only supposed to do like the specialty ones, right. I think was what uh, she had decided to do. And, and Jennings was kind of going to do the other. So I think they've been kind of going back and forth since then. So, yeah. So that was kind of one of the interesting stories of the year. Uh, the next was Meghan Markle, Prince Harry, uh, their detail of the royal family rift in the tell-all interview. So that was kind of one of the big things was that um, Meghan and Harry had sat down with Oprah for a wide-ranging interview back in March, which saw the couple make bombshell accusations about members of the British royal family, including that there were concerns and conversations about how dark their son Archie's skin might be when he was born. Now, since that time, they their daughter uh, was born, Lilibet, um, and they're, you know, you still hear about them uh, in the news, but it was a very telling thing that, you know, that there were you know, members of the family that were concerned because of Megan's racial background. Right. Uh, and it kind of, you know, you pretty much knew the Royals kind of felt a certain way to begin with. And this just well, kind of what's funny added is to the it. The United States <clears throat> tends to get a lot of bad press because of the racial tensions that we have here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's Great Britain that looks down on us. And they have for, for right. years. Right. And to find out that, you know, the royal family of, of Great Britain might harbor some, you know, racist tendencies themselves. Right, right. It kind of brings them down a notch, mm -hmm. you know? And they're, they're a family that is not without controversy to begin with. Oh, absolutely. And they're a family that is, they're an, they're an organization, we'll say. Right. That is struggling to justify their, their continued mm -hmm. existence. Yeah. And of course, people. you know, almost every member of the family has something going on. They you got know. more skeletons in their closet yeah. than the Haunted Mansion does. <laughs> it's a good one. So. 
And then finally, our last story was uh, revolving around Britney Spears and her conservatorship battle. So Britney Spears uh, conservatorship drama was perhaps one of the most talked about controversies in Hollywood in 2021 after numerous documentaries covered the pop star's legal and family drama a judge um lifted her um relieved her sorry relieved her from her 13 year court ordered uh, once and for all in October. Uh, I'm sorry, in November. So this was something I didn't even realize she even had in yeah. place. And n- I guess not that many people knew, but her father was basically in control of basically her whole entire life, everything, yeah. um, who she could see. And, you know, even her, her body autonomy, well, you know, I'll was part of it too. You. What really qualified this for this list for me was that at no point in time during Britney Spears' life have I given a damn about her. And <laughs> reading about this, it actually caught my eye and caught my attention mm. of, one, how could you do this to another human being? Right. Not that I felt sympathy for her. I just felt, you know, humanitarian sympathy for you. Right, right. But, two, how could your own father do this to you? Basically, she was a trained monkey, yeah. you know, and she had her leash and she'd have to go back in the cage it and go out and perform when, you know, and the he would crap the whip. And yeah. these legal proceedings, there was a chance that the judge wasn't going to repeal right. it. And it's right. like, this is like slavery, guys. Lincoln mm-hmm. freed the slaves. Right. You know? And and it's not like she was a minor. Right. <laughs> right. I could understand, okay, you have it until... You know, she's 21 even, right. not even go 18, right. go, okay, 21 or 25. If you, you know, it went on right. so much longer right. than it needed to really go on. So, and granted, it probably saved her life on a number of occasions. And that she is was such true. A, such a train wreck. Right. And I could see where, you know, maybe there were times throughout where, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to let her go from it. And then they didn't because. But the thing is, there comes a point where there has to be some level of personal accountability. Absolutely. If you want to shave your head and be a wacko, then right. go right ahead. Do that. Exactly. So. So that was all we had for our entertainment recap. We'll be right back with our, well, not our insightful pick, I guess. That's what the script says. It's really not that. <laughs> Uh, It's just a recap of our Ocean City Comic Con. We'll be right back. (laughs) So, okay, we went to Ocean City. We went to Maryland. Yeah, three weeks ago. We did. And uh, one of the highlights of that was I managed to trip and fall in the rain and crack a rib and suffer (laughs) through that for the last three weeks. Still suffering from it, which was why we didn't do the podcast. I suffer through one podcast for our insights into teens. Um, but I do have some footage that we took. Let me run that. And let's just talk about our impressions of the uh, of the show. Sure. So what, what were your first thoughts? Um, I thought it was very well done. Uh, bigger than I expected it to be. Uh, I, I was kind of expecting it to be a little smaller. So again, bigger a very nice um venue very clean it was very spaced out um and they seem to have safeguards in place probably the only downsize was the amount of people yeah i don't think they were prepared for that number right i think that was one of the the downfalls we lucked out because we were staying there overnight we happened to be staying at a hotel that they had recommended and it just so happened that the night before they were doing an advance ticket sale. So we decided, Hey, let's just buy the tickets in advance. And that ended up probably being the best thing that happened because when we got there and we only got there a half hour after opening opening, and there was this huge line outside um yeah, you know have, it would have been a 45 <clears throat> minute to an hour wait to get tickets right and that kind of reminded me of like wizard world line like we've yes. never gone Some to of the these years that they really ran that poorly right we've never gone to a smaller comic con that had such a long uh wait to get in so that really was probably the the best 
you know, thing for, for our buck. Um, the only problem with doing that was we didn't get any sort of like, hey, by the way, here's where the program is. Because right. basically they just kind of, we showed our wristband and said, where do we go? And they, they said, oh, just go in here. Side door. Right. That was kind of it. Where maybe if we had waited in line or if we'd bought tickets, we might have been prompted to, hey, look, here's the program type thing or here, you know, scan this and you have a virtual copy. And, and I understand why they weren't handing out things like that. Um, so that was uh, probably the the one downfall is that we didn't know what um, panels were going on or, or special events or, or anything else uh, with that. So, you know, but it wasn't, you know, you don't always need to know because when I had looked at the panels beforehand, a lot of it was anime stuff. <laughs> Your favorite. So I knew we probably weren't going to be doing um, you know, most of that, but it would have been nice just to, you know, have something to look at just right. as a, as a reference. Yeah. And I think, you know, I agree. I think they were, for what they were expecting, they were very well organized. Mm -hmm. I don't think they were expecting anywhere near the number of people they wound up getting. And I think that was the result of <coughs> just you know, people jonesing to get out and do something since things have been shut down. You had such a high turnout. You had people from multiple states show mm -hmm. up for this, which I don't right. think anybody expected. Right, right. Uh, so as a result, everything that would normally be there as a resource was strange. Your, your restrooms were crowded. Your food court, because they didn't bring any supplemental mm -hmm. uh, food vendors in. So you only had the food court, which was strained. Um, the one thing that I think they did have a problem was, but they set everything up in a grid format. But your main entrance, when people walked onto the show floor, was not wide open enough, and you right. would get bot, right. uh, batching up there and, and you know clogged up lanes and stuff like that. But outside of that, your aisles were nice and wide yes. and, and spaced out, which yeah. was really nice. Yeah, because they definitely could have you know pre pandemic squeezed yeah. you know a couple more more lanes together. So it was nice that they had it, and there were you know kind of areas. A little open so that if you did kind of feel claustrophobic, there was a, okay, let me go stand over here yeah, for, for yeah. a little bit. Like at the, at the end caps, you had plenty of room. Right. They had three main aisles that you could walk down. Mm -hmm. So it was it was decently well spaced out. And they had a, a, a number of vendors that, that weren't showing, which kind of surprised yeah, me. Yeah, because again, this was only done for the one day. So it right. wasn't even like it was a, a multiple day. The one thing, and this is every convention that we go to, it would be nice if they just had an area where there's just a bunch of chairs. Right. They so that people, you know, so that you're not in a food court area, you're not taking up a table, you're not taking up something, you know, for somebody that wants to eat, just an area where you just line a bunch of chairs yep. so people that have been, you know, walking up and down can just sit and rest for a couple of minutes. So right. that that's always been, I think, our our biggest complaint about certain uh, shows and, and and events is that they just don't have seating just for you to to sit and rest. Yeah, I agree. And then all in all, I think it you know, with the exception of breaking a rib, I think it was a great trip for us. Mm -hmm. I think I think this is a show that they could spread over two, even three days. You could start it on a Friday mm -hmm. and run it because they had enough vendors there to keep you going. They had enough panels there. Once I went back and looked at the program, mm -hmm. um, didn't do a lot of celebrity stuff, but that's okay. Right. Um, we That's not something really that we do a lot of. Right. Um, but yeah, I think definitely they had enough a lot of there people... for people to be there multiple days mm -hmm. uh, for short periods of time. Like, you don't come in there and spend the whole day there. You come in, you spend a couple hours each day, and you, you do different things. Right, and a lot of people were cosplaying. You know, it, a lot it was more than I thought. Yeah, yeah it, it was almost like every other person. Almost made know. me feel like I should have put my costume on. Yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, it was a it was a uh, a good trip for us, and I mm -hmm. think uh, you know. Assuming that it continues on, we might do it again as a nice little getaway next yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. It was close enough for us where, you know, it wasn't that long of a drive to to get there. Uh, the other thing, too, is there's, uh, you know, even though it was off season for Ocean City, a number of the restaurants are open. Uh, even the boardwalk now, granted, the boardwalk wasn't, wasn't open very late, but the boardwalk 
had a couple right. of things that were opened, you know. And SantaCon was going and, on. You could and do it a just, pub crawl with Santa. <laughs> right. And it just so happened that the same weekend uh, as this was SantaCon were, was going on that we didn't know about. So SantaCon is always done that weekend in Ocean City where this was is normally done, what, November? I think right. they've done it before. Right. Uh, so we'll have to see. We'll see, you know, when they decide to do it. It was definitely a big success for them. So I, I can't imagine that they wouldn't be doing it again next year. Yeah. So we'll be right back with our after thoughts. Go with our afterthoughts that I didn't cue any of them up. Sure. So uh, to get your calendar ready for next year, we have ZoloCon, which will be March 5th and March 6th. And that's in Warminster, Warminster, Pennsylvania. That's at the Fugue, uh, which is one of our favorite venues to to go to just for the sheer enjoyment of of that location. Uh, so it's normally done like end of February, beginning of March. This was the one that they had postponed until the summer last year. So it's only been a couple of months since they've done it um, before and they're, you know, doing it again. So good that they're kind of getting that was back the one that on I track. Didn't make it to last time. Cause right. I Cause you well. wasn't, you weren't feeling well. So hopefully you'll be feeling better for this one and you can join us for that. And then come April, there is the, uh, Delaware train show on Saturday, April 2nd, and then the April Fool's toy show, which is Sunday, April 3rd, another venue that we enjoy, um, which is at the Nurse Shrine Center in Newcastle, Delaware. Um, they had the show in October, but we didn't, uh, we weren't able to go because of band, marching band season. Right. Um, so this is one they, they do a couple throughout the year. This is one we can get to. This is one that we will uh, be able to get We're to. Not bound by marching band for this one. <laughs> not, not yet. We don't know when marching band starts. And then finally, uh, Fan Expo, uh, which was formerly known as Wizard World, the, the new company, uh, will be at the Philadelphia Convention Center also in April, April uh, 8th through the 10th now this is one that i'm very interested in seeing how they handle it because it's been a few years since we've been the wizard world right um but that's one that we used to go to quite frequently right right so they they were doing discount tickets i think up until christmas i i'm sure there's probably some discount tickets some kind of discount. you know going on um you know this was one that was supposed to be at the philadelphia right. the greater philadelphia expo center but i guess it wasn't great enough it for wasn't because we were kind of excited about that because we we're like great we don't have to pay for parking and deal with you know the long long walk and yep. Now we're like, eh, it's in Philly again. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. You we'll know, April is it. still a couple months away. So. Yeah. So. Uh, but I think that was it for today's show. We went kind of long. It was one of our longest shows. Uh, so I'm not going to bore people with uh, my show plugs at the end here. Just going to say uh, happy uh, new year to everybody. Yeah, yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll have a better year next year and COVID won't be nearly as much of an impact. Here's to 2022. Amen to that. That's it. We're done. We're be out. safe, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.